Welcome to the Blueprint Podcast, where we throw out the old blueprint so you can become who you were always meant to be. I'm your host, Jason Smith. And if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button and share this episode with your friends on social media and tag me in it at JaybirdFit. Today, we have Dr. Tara Lynn and... part for a second because my back hurt <laughs> I, I got a jolt i'm like oh, oh no <laughs> yeah damp staining okay We're, i know it's <laughs> never again never again hire that stuff out you're 45 now come on god damn i'm the oldest bitch in the room <laughs> you are it's fine you had a birthday i might have told him that it's not a big deal i didn't say how old you were though yeah we might dive a little bit into that too <sighs> Okay. Because so initially when you and I started talking, we had this thing about Gen X. And so I think it'll be mm -hmm. fun to, to mm -hmm. touch on that a little bit. Sure. All right. Today we have Dr. Tara Lynn and therapist Jen. Whoop. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get with us. I absolutely love the enthusiasm there. This is great. I told you, Jen brings the color every, oh, everywhere she goes. Man, I can't help it. It's word vomit <laughs> and noise vomit, all kinds of vomit. Wonderful. Dr. Tara Lynn and I spoke earlier last year, and we were trying to set up a podcast opportunity to meet each other and to talk about some mental health things and some Gen X things, because Gen X, let's face it, is the forgotten generation. We don't talk enough about them. And since we're both Gen X, I think this is a great opportunity. But we also have therapist Jen with us. Mm -hmm. So ther <laughs> therapist Jen, tell us a little bit about who you are and who you help. Yeah. In terms of the age piece, I actually, so I'm 41. Okay. So you guys are bringing that into the play right away. Millennial. So I'm, I'm right at the end. Of, I'm right at the cusp. And so it doesn't really make sense because I don't fit most of what that is at all. However, I am. Yes. Millennial. Hi. It's okay. me. Thank Hi. You. I'm the problem. I'm it's the problem. Me. I know everything. Okay. Oh, yes. we're bring Taylor into this already. Okay. No, we're not okay. Let's, we're let's, not. Let's, we're sorry. not. Shh, quiet. Not bad. Okay. I will um, edit that. You get <laughs> I yeah, I'm a therapist, as you said, right? I have a private practice at this point, and I help clients with all kinds of ailments from anxiety, depression to nutrition issues to hey, I want a holistic chick who can help me with things that are a little off the grid. Okay, that's what I do. I got a private practice. It hasn't always been that way, um, but that's who I am and what I do. I love it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tara Lynn, same question. Who are you and who do you help? I am Dr. Tara Lynn, and I help whoever comes my way, really. <laughs> I think I'm having an identity crisis at are, this point, but yeah, I think I am. We might flesh that out today in this podcast, but sure. so yeah, I've been a therapist for, oh my gosh, I think somewhere between 15 and 20 years at this point. So I am solidly at the tail end of my career. So about every 10 years, I change focus, and so about 10 years ago, I changed focus and focusing more on holistic ways to help people with mental health. Now I do have a private practice, standard therapy, but like with Jen, because Jen and I are actually in the same private practice now, which is another story to talk about later, we really do focus a lot on nutrition for mental health and alternatives for mental health. The time has come. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's me. One of the things I admire about you the most is you've created your social media network and it's just amazing. You have so many followers, but the way that you address all the different situations that you get presented with on social media, I think is absolutely phenomenal. One of the biggest questions people always hit us with is what are your credentials? And it's okay. I've got a master's degree. So it's, I've recognized that. Yeah. Some credentialing somewhat. Yeah, sure. It's important, but there's also this mm -hmm. other aspect that you can actually read books. Yes. You can listen to podcasts. You can take mm. notes. You can get really, your own research off the internet. You can really sit and think about this stuff for mm. longer than eight seconds and give yourself the opportunity to embody this information and understand it. And then this magical thing happens. You really start to comprehend it and you're like, holy smokes. So then you have this light bulb moment and now you can deploy all this information that you've read, that you've taken in, that you understand, that you now comprehend and you feel confident with it enough that you can relay it to other people and poss potentially help them as well. I just want people to recognize like you have that capability within you. You just don't necessarily believe that's that you have that, that you have that ability to make that happen for yourself. Yeah. That's empowerment, isn't it? That's like mm -hmm. an, oh, yeah. an empowered patient mm -hmm. at, at its core. Right. And I think when you are my gosh, so 15 to 20 years in mental health, 
you see some things, <laughs> you see yeah. some things, you see some things that are not textbook related. You've seen some things. Jen and I have had the most extreme mental health training, I think, of any person. Our background is working with the most mentally ill inmates in our state. And I, <laughs> that was extreme. We've seen many yeah. extreme things from self-injurious behaviors to personality disorders to the seriously mentally ill. And then you go into private practice. You're like, man, this is really easy. Wow. <laughs> it's a totally different <laughs> ball game. <laughs> you know, and it's funny though, because when I first came into private practice, I had a lot of clients who would come in and be like, I'm probably the worst, the most mentally ill person you've ever met. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, not really. Yeah. But but we don't have that perspective when we live in our own bodies, right? We think it's the worst thing ever. But we always hear this from people. I thought I was the only one. And it's yeah. like, ah, we want this exclusivity, don't we? We want that for some reason. What do you think the reason is for that, that we want that so badly? Oh, it's familiar. I think it's super familiar. So it feels good when you can define yourself by something that you truly can understand. And it, it, it actually gives you this awkward, strange sense of purpose because that's who you are. You define yourself in that way to not define yourself in that way is very uncomfortable to go. Oh, I actually I can get things done. I'm not as ill as the label says I am. I don't fit into that box, right? That requires like leaning into a whole different space. One which our environment and society and the medical model and all these systems tell us, oh no, you, that doesn't fit there. No, you are bipolar. Here's where you go. You're right here. So that is very, that I think that's why. Sorry about that. I do have a German shepherd. I should have warned you. Um, <laughs> yeah, mine's been walking around too. I, she mine keeps will going back and forth. Several appearances. <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> Okay. We were just talking about because Jen has a dog and I have a dog and both of our dogs appear in therapy all the time. As a matter of fact, my dog appears in mostly all of my TikTok videos right back there, just laying yep. there like a lump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yep. we're totally fine with it. My I clients get worried about that when the dog yeah, is there, they right? Get they get worried. The dog. Where's it's your so dog? I'm like, oh, oh, there he is. Well, there's Frank. He's yeah, there. there's Frankie. <laughs> People always say it's not the blueprint podcast without Chloe making an entrance at some point. You know, it's interesting. I wanted to piggyback off of that idea of labels because when we start labeling ourselves the question who are you right is a is a pretty deep question and most people don't know unless they've been labeled by something right i'm a mom i'm a grandma i'm a gen x right, right. and i'm i also have major depressive disorder i don't but i'm just saying a lot of people like to have that classification as a way to define mm -hmm. Who they are. It's comfortable. And it's comfortable and it makes sense in some ways, but it's also very damaging. If I only defined myself as a mom, then I'm not me, right? If I only define myself within the confines of a mental health diagnostic label, then I keep myself back from a lot of things. So it's this weird balance and we are in a society. You can see it all over TikTok right now. Yeah. Everybody wants a mental health disorder. It's where the cool kids are. Are you yeah. even are you even alive if you don't have a mental health disorder? That's really what it's come down to. That's and, what it feels like sometimes. And so I look at some of this stuff and I step back and it's everybody wants to give Gen X a, a hard time because it's like, well, you guys are damaging and you're hurtful and, and you're all of these things. But it's no... It can be true, right? But at the same time, it's just we remember a time period where we didn't have computers and we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have social media. We had Atari and we evolved into <laughs> Nintendo and Commodore 64 and Apple 2GS and we grew up with technology. But we also remember a time of laying in our beds, no air conditioning. Oh, window, yeah. window wide open and you wake up at 5 45 6 in the morning to these birds and you're just like you're so angry at the birds shut up <laughs> and but we lived in that way and it was almost you're in your parasympathetic nervous system at that point because we like to use all these different terms for psychology and stuff but no problem but yeah it, but you're so you're in this relaxed state and then today obviously that's very much not the experience that most people are having Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm thinking about the labels, like Gen X labels, like, no. how did I label myself? I was a cheerleader, clearly, like, why oh. wouldn't it be? Anyway, I was a cheerleader, and the only labels we have are, like, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Like, right. that was pretty yeah. much it. We didn't have, I don't, we didn't really label ourselves anything besides maybe what we were doing, the activities we were involved in, and the grade we were in. And that's freeing, because then you can be whoever you want to be. 
You don't have to be stuck in that label that somebody else gave you. We, we didn't even have the terminology back then. And if we no. did, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't what was, exp again, we didn't have social media, so we weren't exposed mm -hmm. to it. So we didn't have these words that we could then put on our self map and say, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is what I experience. And I am my experiences and all of these things. Happen. Words so, to weaponize. Correct. Yeah, they, so, they truly do. Mm -hmm. what, what do you guys think about just therapy speak in general and how it's utilized today? I got to say, yeah. if you're listening to the podcast, I think I just rolled my eyeballs in the back of my head. I'm not sure if they're going to come forward yet. So you might want to watch the YouTube <laughs> version of this. But anyway, I'm waiting for my diagnostic Bible back there to start on fire. On <laughs> right. Once we start Busting. talking, it's going to go kapoom. Because yeah. we're going to not, yeah, it's going to, it's going to be a little real here about our opinion on, on these labels. No, I love it. Let's do it. I actually can't see you guys because I'm looking straight into my camera. Oh, oh. really? You didn't know you're, my eyeballs were in the back of my head. You're over here. So I don't know if you're making okay. faces or not. All oh, right. okay. So I could just, I just told you and watch the video later. I, I right. will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. No, we, when it comes to labels, this is something, and actually on TikTok, this one blew up mm. for you, Terry, when you did this post, it was unbelievable. And essentially the gist of it was the basis of these labels, right? So our field, this Bible that we use, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Mental Disorders, this is how we label people. Oh, you got one of those, right? Yeah, that oh, lovely. Look at that. Look at that. You've got I one. I don't here. even have the updated okay. version because I don't give I, a I don't shit. Either. But anyway. Get ready for that to start. <laughs> That's going to start on fire for you, Jason. So get it, ready. What's funny? Funny is I thought I was going to need it at some point and I started thumbing through it and I really gave it a lot of thought. And what you might not know is I, I was a police officer for eight years and I did crime scene. And so okay. a big part of my experience is related to all the different types of trauma that are experienced, not only for the officer from their perspective, but also from mm -hmm. people in the general population and the things that they experience up to and including leaving the planet permanently. And so you try to make sense of all this stuff by gathering all this different information and you see a therapist for a little bit and you start to take this stuff on and you read the notes that get left behind and all this other stuff. And you really come to this, I, I oversimplify it and people are like, that's so reductive. Sure, but I, I like taking things down to a more simplified level that I can understand because I might mm -hmm. not be as smart as other people. And so this helps me make sense of me and my yeah. position and where I'm at. And I just thought a lot of this comes down to self-love. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. And or I've done something so egregious that I can't take back. Nobody's ever going to love me again. So then we mm -hmm. get to this place of peace out. I'm done. And you have to find a way to make sense of that. So for me, it came all the way down to self-love. Mm -hmm. I do. I have to say a couple things about the DSM. There was a time early in my career that the DSM, you couldn't get your hands on it unless you were a professional. Like it wasn't until Amazon really came out that everybody's ordering this thing. And I, I remember Jen, she, <laughs> Jen is so great. She had the, you can tell us, <laughs> what did you do to your DSM? What did you, oh, how did you make it a Bible? What did you do? Because oh, I I, you should see it. I, oh, I went man. through and I tabbed the shit out of it. Every <laughs> it, single, it, oh. every other page has a tab. Every category is a tab on the top. I slept with that thing next to my <laughs> bed. I am not shitting you. <laughs> All right. I'll pledge the truth here because when I started in the field, okay, that was 15 years ago, but one, yes, it was hard to get your hand on that book. So the one I have has been with me for, for a while since that five came out. It was not the first one I started with because you couldn't just order right. it. But two, I was so obsessed with what that label needed to be for people because that's what I was taught. Like the whole basis of what I was doing as a therapist was you have to put a label on somebody because that label, similar to when you're in private practice and running insurance, that label means something. It allows people to receive services. It allows people yeah. to have insurance, right? Even in the prison system for us, when I would label somebody with, that would be very helpful for treatment because now you can get into this AODA, this addiction program, because you have this diagnosis or yes, you can come into your schizophrenia group because you have a label that shows that you're struggling with auditory hallucinations and visible hallucinations. Even though that could totally be a trauma response. Nope. Guess what? You got schizophrenia, right? So these labels helped push people in the systems and still do today where they need to go to get services. And so that was in my a naive brain and how where I can sit as a human now and say I did disservices. And Terry and I talk about this in, in our first episode of our podcast. This is we are going to talk about the truth for us, too, because we did. That's what we knew. 
And that's what was pushed on us. And I couldn't get people services without that either. And so it, in my brain, can. you still can't, right? Practice. No, you right. can't. So in my brain, I put this book, these labels on a pedestal right. because it was the necessary step to get those things to happen for people now even and even in, in the prison system, right? So that's why it was so important. So I, that whole thing is, it looks like something I've carried around. It's like the coffee table book that I've right. spilled something on it a hundred times. It's taped together. Pretty sure I ripped a page out and had to glue it back in at one point because I was pissed about something I read. But it looks horrible because I've lived. Well, with meanwhile, it for mine is on fire, Jen. And it then so she fire. goes, and then she goes on social media on TikTok, and that's where we started this conversation. And she posts a whole thing about this and how these contributors to this book, a hundred percent of them in certain diagnostic categories, got millions of dollars in kickbacks from Big Pharma. Right. And so she puts this out on TikTok, and light looks like she's gonna light it on fire. And got just that response was fantastic. Talk yeah. about a community that understands what you were trying to convey. Mm -hmm. It was unbelievable. I do want to say those pages would not burn. So <laughs> does that say something? I <laughs> tried. I really not tried a, to put it on fire. It would not burn. <laughs> so. Which we're not encouraging anybody to start any type <laughs> no. of fires or do anything like that. Use no. your discernment. Do what's appropriate. Burn, yeah. be burn safe. books, burn yeah. bras. Here you go, Terry. Here you go. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> now there's been the shift where the mental health community outside of clinicians and therapists have deified this manual mm -hmm. because I have this experience and there's overlap mm -hmm. in all of these different things. And so oh. now this is the label that I'm going to give to myself. And I talk a lot about it in terms of like anxious and avoidant relationships and mm -hmm. the benefits of attachment theory. Some people are like, attachment theory doesn't exist. It actually doesn't matter if it exists or not. What matters is that you have the ability to understand who you are, where you're going, what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then how you relate to other people and how they receive you. Yes. When, when you can get to that point, then that's meta awareness, right? We're thinking about thinking. We're zooming out from the current situation where this omniscient presence looking down at the experience that we're having and creating a story that is probably going to be more accurate than the label that we're actually giving to ourselves because th like attachment theory, it's a spectrum. So there's going to be overlap. Not everything mm -hmm. is going to be true all of the time, or there's going to be some things that are true when you're around this person, other things that are true when you're around this other person. And that's where we get really confused when we start diving into this. So I just encourage people, they get mad at me. Why don't you focus on all of the attachments? Because I want you to focus on you. What I really want you to do is focus on how you feel. Mm -hmm. What's going on inside the body? What are you experiencing? Why are you chasing after this person that has made it very clear they don't want to be with you? Why do we do that? And why are we trying to prove ourselves to this other person? If you take your power back for a second, zoom out, observe what's happening, you'll realize, oh, there was this other experience that happened. And yeah, and, and you start to navigate it a little bit better. And sometimes that requires help. But other times it just requires you sitting with yourself in silence. It's the now what version of things like, okay, so I can diagnose you with 16 different things. And by the way, if you go to 16 different therapists, you're going to walk out with 16 different diagnoses, like mm -hmm. because of that overlap we were talking about. But a diagnosis is for the person, not necessarily a now what it's that's where it ends often. Oh, I got a diagnosis. And so now I can hinge on this label for the rest of my life. And I'm like, but I always go, but now what? What do you want right. to do with that diagnosis? How do you want to change your life? What do you want to be within that mm -hmm. diagnosis? How do you want to change it? And this runs into another problem of so many of the diagnoses that we have are perpetual. Like you can't ever shake them. And so once mentally ill, quote unquote, always mentally ill, right? And once you've got, and Jen's got a great story about this, once you've got a diagnosis on your permanent record. Right. Good luck getting Good luck. that off. And let's think about, especially for our kids, how that might impact their adult life. A lot mm -hmm. of times very negatively. Yep. Yeah. I had did, I did a post somewhere on one of my socials about the government. And once you're labeled with the diagnosis, it's going to, it's going to stay there. And it does not matter if you were given that diagnosis when you were a child. You could have been six, seven years old and going through multiple traumas in your life and you got AD, labeled with ADHD, right? And that does not go away. And so here, Terry and I sit on our end because we have people that come to us and we'll do diagnostic testing on. And sometimes the function of why they want to do it is because they, they want to get into the uh, government job. 
but they're told no, because this diagnosis you had when you were six, guess what? That is going to, that's going to, that's going to infringe on your ability to be in any branch of the military. And you're not passing, you're not passing that part. And so we have had this happen so many times and I just recently did, and it would just, it just blew my mind. And Same it happens with life insurance policies. Like it, it, if correct. you got yep. these diagnoses on your life yep. insurance policy, yep. you might not get that life insurance policy. That correct. has happened multiple times mm -hmm. in practice, in private practice. So I yeah. don't think that people really understand what the risk is of a diagnosis. Yeah. And I think that's part of also, I, you see my TikTok, I talk about informed consent. Mm -hmm. This is part of informed consent. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for me? And you'd be surprised because many people who go to the doctor, they get a prescription, antidepressant or something like that. They get the script and they'll come into session and be like, so have you ever been diagnosed with anything? No, I don't think so. Are you on any antidepressants? Yeah. <laughs> For how long? 20 years. I'm like, then you've been diagnosed with something yeah. and right. you don't know it. I have. Yes, because you have to be in order to get mm -hmm. those things. So it's just, it's mind boggling to me how much informed consent is lost and basically put on the consumer as the consumer's responsibility to just know or to find mm -hmm. out or to dig deeper when you're in those spaces, like it, you rely on your care provider to do all that for you. Yeah. And I think sometimes they also think, oh, they're in here, they're depressed, they're whatever. And I have to treat them with kid gloves. I can't tell them the full truth about this medication because then they might not take it. Mm -hmm. And I know they need to. So it becomes very manipulative as well, the omission of information. And that, again, that goes down to diagnostics. So if you're listening to this and your kid is going to the doctor or you, but especially your child, ask, what are mm -hmm. the future implications of my child having these diagnoses? Because you might not like what you hear. Yeah. And that's truth you need to hear because there is yeah. a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're, I'm sorry, your six-year-old is not going to be the same when they're 25. Okay. <laughs> Okay. No. <laughs> you ask anybody on the dating scene today in 2024. <laughs> oh my God, this is and, a whole different ball of wax. And, and oh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, the, the other thing I like that you tackle on, on your TikTok is, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? The answer is oh, always that. no. Mm -hmm. Can you dive into a little bit of that with us on first line of defense when we might think that maybe some things are going on? And what should people do? Where should they go? And again, we're not giving advice here. This is just general information for you guys. Listen, it's cumulative. The things you do in your life are cumulative, right? On a basic level, if you show up with either fatigue or extreme anxiety, are you drinking a lot of caffeine? Are you drinking alcohol before you go to yeah, bed? Yeah, what's your relationship with alcohol? It's exactly. Like all mm -hmm. of these things, they matter. Alcohol and food. food. I always ask people, what is your relationship with what goes in your mouth? Yeah. Hey, leave me alone with the food, okay? <laughs> oh, no. Hey, you're, this come is on. coming from oh, a huge on. coffee addict. Two Same. years ago, mm -hmm. I was drinking a pot and a half of coffee by myself every day yeah. and feeling so fatigued. It was mm -hmm. ridiculous. So mm -hmm. now I try to limit it to about two to three cups a week is all I do with caffeinated beverages. Nice. So yeah, yeah, I, it, yeah that's I did a whole year. I did a whole year without any caffeine, a whole year just to reset everything. And it was the best thing mm -hmm. I ever did because yeah, you're I mean, also sober, right? Sure. I haven't had, oh, a, okay. I, no, I haven't had a drink in eight years. I don't know if you want to call that sober. I, I get, so I same here. It's been a little over a year. And yeah. I, I don't think of it as, oh, I accomplished like this task or anything. It's just, I made a decision and I did it and I didn't like the relationship I had with alcohol. So right. I moved away from it. So right. mm -hmm. I wasn't a huge drinker before I made that. No. I don't feel like I need to explain myself, but I'm just going to okay. shout out to my husband who is sober for 30 years. So he has a sobriety journey. I just made a decision that I didn't like it anymore. It didn't right. serve me well. So that was about eight years ago. That wasn't as hard to me as caffeine was. Oh, really? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. No, caffeine yeah. was ridiculous. But, but anyway, so it's this, Jen and I, we talk about the four pillars of mental health, eat, sleep, move, meditate. Yep. Those are the four big pillars. What is your relationship like in each one of those pillars? Mm -hmm. And the eat one includes drink, anything mm -hmm. that you put in your mouth. But People want to skip over that because they, if your relationship in each one of those pillars is terrible, right? 
it's hard to get out of that because that has been an overtime situation that you've built up. So it seems easier to get a pill. Yes. You know? It's easier to get a pill than to quit caffeine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you've got those pillars. And then to add on to that, then one of the first things I say to people too, is you also need to get curious about medical pieces and bringing that yes. into your life too, because that matters. Now I'm not saying that you had a diagnosis medically that was given to you and, and, and you either jump all in and go, this causes everything or take it away and go, this caused nothing. But that matters. Physiologically, those pieces matter. And so at a basic starting point too, I will ask people, tell me about that history. Let's get curious about it. And what, what have you been through with that? Because that those medical and mental health were an intertwined machine, right? It really plays off of each other, right? It goes hand in hand. And so I often tell people to get curious about that and make sure you pay attention to what that is as well in your history and currently for you. Because that's a piece people sometimes forget about. And then when they open up and start talking about it, there's all these medical ailments, many of which have a prescription on them to help manage versus bringing in the movement or the exercise piece that could change right. some of that for some people. So those are basic starting spaces. Um, when you're asking a little bit about that, that's yeah. where I start. You know, I just want to add, hold on. I want to add one thing because when people are on so many medications, not just psych meds, but any other medication, there is nutrient depletion that occurs with that. And so that's some, again, informed consent, right? What nutrients will be depleted if I take this medication? Yes. What do I need to be supporting mm -hmm. if I take this medication? And nobody talks about that either, but it's well-documented. Yep. And if you believe that a single nutrient depletion won't change anything for you, how about you deplete your vitamin C for a second? I, I have one for you. B12. Yeah. Yeah. I don't absorb B12, so I have to get shots. But I didn't find that out until two years ago when I got injured. And they were trying, they were doing nerve tests and all this other stuff. And they're like, we should do a panel. And then we figured out I was severely B12 deficient. After a couple months of getting the shots, all of a sudden, I'm just like, I feel different. I feel really good. Like, I'm actually happy as well. And I'm like, who is this person? Is this going to last? <laughs> And <laughs> good to be true. It really was because now all yeah. of a sudden I'm literally, I wake up, I'm happy. Things are going well. I'm just like, this is a complete mm -hmm. shift from where yeah. I was. I was extremely unhappy mm -hmm. and I won't go down that rabbit hole, but it was just like, it was not good. So to mm -hmm. have that dramatic shift in the way that I was thinking and feeling mm -hmm. was huge. And I'm not saying everybody's got a B12 deficiency. No, get, but vit get vitamin, vitamin, D, vitamin D is another huge one, mm -hmm. especially in the Midwest. No, actually, I shouldn't say that, especially everywhere. People in Florida are deficient in vitamin D, the old elderly people in Florida. That's because as you age, your body doesn't make the vitamin D as efficiently. So aging people need to look at their vitamin D. Any person needs to look at vitamin D um, deficiency. But again, getting back to the vitamin C, that's a, an extreme example. But vitamin C and scurvy was a huge deal. Like that was a huge medical problem for people. And not to get all scientific, but if you look at the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell that makes ATP, which is your energy, the Krebs cycle involved in all that has to have a whole host of B vitamins, different B yep. vitamins to make that whole thing happen. And so if you're taking a medication that depletes your B vitamins, I'm sorry, but you're effed. Like mm -hmm. your energy is going to be sapped. That cycle on a cellular level, on a cellular level is going to mess you up. Not to mention your neurotransmitters require a whole host of vitamins, your B vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin C, a whole bunch of vitamins to have to make a neurotransmitter work, right? So again, if you are taking medication that depletes nutrients, yep. you're going to be in trouble eventually. Yes. You will be in trouble. So- yep. Yeah. Anyway, that was my soapbox for the Look day. at you got all, all scientific <laughs> there. All using scientific. words. I don't know. It's Big Friday. Words. I got my hair done today. Like I, I love know. it. Yeah. I want to give people another relatable story to that. And uh, again, I'm not saying get off blood pressure medication, but I got put on blood pressure medication and there was a, a series of things that were going on. And so concurrently what's happening is I'm also B12 deficient. Mm -hmm. And so there's the stuff that's going on in the background. Ultimately, I ended up getting off my blood pressure medication and have had zero issues. But the biggest thing was the doctors that were treating me and no shade on them, but they don't look at the root cause of why is your blood pressure so high? Right. 
what's causing that story on that too <laughs> please share it i would love to hear it <laughs> well, oh I, boy two times like one the one of the first times i went to the doctor about my thyroid and it was in normal range right so yeah. it was a normal range whatever that is and um, i was complaining that i was fatigued and within 30 minutes i was prescribed an antidepressant a stimulant and a sleep aid okay it was my thyroid. It was my thyroid. Now the whole blood pressure thing, this kind of reminded me of this about a year and a half ago, I was um, changing some of my thyroid medication. And for the first time in my life in 30 years, I was unknowingly pushed into hyperthyroid, which raises your blood pressure, um, which causes gastrointestinal distress, which causes anxiety. And I was experiencing all of that, but because I'd never experienced hyperthyroid, I was always hypo, I didn't know what was going on. So I had to go to a doctor for something else. And I'm in the chair and they're doing the blood pressure and it was sky high for the first time in my life. First time. Now, if my blood pressure would have been high or high-ish all along, I would have been like, oh, okay. But for the first time, it was documented as high. And what did they want to do immediately? Hmm. We need to prescribe you some blood pressure medications. And I said, no. I said, hold on. This is the first time this has ever happened. This is not typical for me. I went back to my the doctor who was doing my thyroid stuff. And I'm like, we got to run some labs. And sure as shit, I was in hyperthyroid, which jacked my blood pressure sky high. They didn't ask, even though it was in my chart that I had thyroid issues. Like that didn't even come up. It was a single event. They wanted to medicate the single event. Yes. Instead of looking at me like a whole human, what else could be going mm -hmm. on? Or getting curious. This is the first time she's ever had high blood pressure why? And they kept going, well, it's probably part of it's probably white coat syndrome and all. And I'm like, man, no, like every, every time I'm they always like <laughs> every time. <Yeah. laughs> so yeah, that's mine too. And I didn't go on them and it took a few months for my thyroid to get back. But then my, then, so now I know anytime my blood pressure goes up, it's a thyroid issue. Yeah. But you got to look at people like whole humans and that includes yeah. any physical problems they might have, they might know about, or getting curious about Maybe you should go back to the doctor and check out to make sure you don't have something else going on at the same time here as mental health. Mm -hmm. I like to believe for most people, mental health doesn't live in isolation. It's not one right. thing. It's mm -hmm. many things. And physical health can be a huge part of that. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those things. I feel like they should have a target profile for individuals where they literally have a full scope picture of kind of what's happening in your life. What are the stressors? What are you experiencing? What do you go through? What do you eat in a day? How many hours mm -hmm. are you sleeping? And again, it gets treated as a single issue because you walk in and you're like, yeah, this is what's going on. And they're like, yeah, okay. And so then they treat the symptom and we don't really go much deeper than that. And yep. as somebody who's not a medical professional, I don't like the way that feels because it's like, no, I, I actually want to take care of this thing and eliminate it if at all possible. Like, how do we get there? Mm hmm it's funny because I think when I'm in the doctor's office and I refuse certain things, I always think they hate about it. Oh, they do. I, when I refuse the three psych meds, she actually said, then why are you here? And I was like, because I wanted help with my thyroid. Like I thought maybe right. you could offer me something else. And I cried in the parking lot afterwards, just so everybody knows. But anyway, so oh. I, yeah, I know, but I was still empowered enough to say no and walk away. Whereas mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people have that self-empowerment right. uh, to walk away or to say, hold on, slow this down for a minute. Let me think this through. I don't think that a lot of people have that. And so I think that's how we got here in the first place, especially when it comes to psychiatric medications. They just dole them out half the mm -hmm. time you know, yeah. for anything, for a situational event right? That's my story of my psychiatric meds, right? One little bitty situational event and 20 years later, still trying to get, finally get off of it because some asshole in high school dumped me. Like, what? Wait, like, what? Let's go, yeah. Let's go let's back here. Jen because she got her ass dumped. I, Jen, let's hear the story gotta... because this is going to be so relatable to oh, my audience. Man. There is you it? go. Okay. All right. You um, brought it up. So I did. I know. I So I think it was uh, senior year of high school or freshman year of college. We actually talked about this the other day. Terry and I were, and I'm like, I can't remember the year because my past memory is really shitty. Side effect of Lexapro. Informed yeah. consent would have told me that. Didn't know that. Lost a lot of memories along the way. 
Me too. But I went in and yeah, it was, I was having a situational trigger happening and I had broken up with my boyfriend and I was not well. I was very depressed. I was very tearful, lethargic, like constantly just feeling down. Appetite was shifting. And so it was, okay, Jen, here's an option, right, for you to take Lexapro. And I think I was probably about 19, 18 or 19 when that started. Okay. And so I said, yeah, sure. I didn't know any better. I remember my mom at the time too was like, you know what, Jen, just this would be helpful. You need to get through this. I was just starting college too, right? Now this is coming together. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to get through school. So all the things. Fast forward here now, 21 years later. Okay. And here I am sitting, thinking back. And each year I go back in and the questioning, the line of questioning is always, you seem like you're doing really great. And I usually say, yeah, I feel awesome. And yet never was it, let's, maybe you don't need this anymore. Let's talk about the start. Has your circumstances changed in the last year? Yes. I did not marry that guy. I didn't marry that guy. Yeah, I did not. Oh my God. Has nothing else in the trajectory of the last year like infiltrated your life to go, guess what? You're better. No, nope. It's only the med. It's only the med. Mm -hmm. And so with that, then also came a a lot of side effects, right? And in things that happened to me over time, precious memories were lost. I can think back to having my kids and things are very foggy. Memories that, that I was there for and really in are, are not clear. And so that was a big one for me, lack of libido. I would go in and say, I have no sex drive. This is gone. This is impacting my marriage. And she's, there isn't a med yet for females like there is for the men, but let me get you a sex therapist. I can refer you to one of those. So here's this added on all my, like, I'm the problem. Hi, it's me. Yeah, you and get inundated with all this self-doubt. Correct. Yes. It, it did. And I lost myself over time. Yeah. And, and that became part of who I was. I was told you cannot live without this. You won't be able to go without this. Look how great it is because look how good you're doing. And so all of the losing of the memories and the libido and some of the other pieces that happened too. I, when you, I got to go back to something you said, Terry, when you talk about nutrient deficiency, one of the biggest nutrients that is depleted on that medication is sodium. Okay. And what happens when your body starts to be depleted from sodium? I remember sitting there having these like heart flutters and feeling just super lethargic at times and going, oh my God, I must be having a panic attack and just feeling all this when, how do I really know that there wasn't a huge sodium deficiency in certain spaces, right? Because that's what that med depletes. That is the number one nutrient. That would have been part of a great informed consent conversation. Fast forward now, then I get to here as an adult, I'm um, 20 years later trying to get off of this. And the Mm. hyperbolic taper that will take me a couple years, probably from start to finish, and the inability to even slowly taper down in some aspects because the withdrawal effects are so bad, I can't function. And so it's, okay, we're going to go back on it. And it's all low and slow. And of course, I've got this great plan, but no one ever said, Jen, when you want to get off of this med someday, get ready. Cause it's going to, it's going to freaking suck. Your life is going to pause and stop unless you have all these resources dialed in. So no wonder I would have been a forever consumer. All right. Have I, had I not get cured, gotten inquisitive about this and tried other interventions, I would have been a forever consumer because I don't want to feel those withdrawal effects. And so it, it's all of this wrapped into this heavy story of shit. You got dumped by your boyfriend wow. and you go back to the beginning and I'm like, That was it. That was the beginning. And it just was constantly fed to me, not volitionally by any means, but that that the doctors practiced and that you're doing great. That means you need to stay on this. It's clearly helping you. And so here we go. I want to add in because part of Jen and my story is this idea that we also perpetuated some of that language in practice. It's very humbling to come out and be like, we have not been perfect. And we subscribed to a lot of the rhetoric that we were taught by Mm -hmm. the professionals that we admired, right? Like your supervisors and other people that are doing the same thing. And we've said all of these things to other people. If you're doing well, why would you want to get off? Or Mm -hmm. would you rather have sex or be happy? Happy. Mm -hmm. Is that even a question? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) would you rather gain 80 pounds and not feel depressed? Like these things don't even make sense to me. 
or the idea of if for somebody who doesn't want to take it or cannot stand the side effects because that happens too. It's like a diabetic taking insulin. To me, those words now are so vile, like they're yeah. so disgusting because they're so manipulative and they don't, again, take in somebody's personal experience. If you've gained, for some people, any weight, but some of them 80, 100 pounds on this stuff, and I'm trying to convince you that's suddenly okay. It's suddenly mm -hmm. okay that you've got this metabolic weight because your mental health is in check. How ridiculous to think that somebody who is 100 pounds overweight has their mental health in check yep. because they're having all these metabolic problems too. Like that is the mm -hmm. most ridiculous. Like I think about the shit that I said and I'm like, mm -hmm. I yep. like what? Yep. Somebody just needed to put a sock in my mouth at that point. But it's just all it's, the it's things. It's true though. We, yeah. we did. We perpetuated as well. well right? You, you, you have know? a belief in the system right mm -hmm. that you signed up and educated yourself to be a part of and the this sure is, thing by the way we were also scared shitless to, to uh not get sued because that was one of the oh, things yeah. in the prison that it was right. like you you gotta follow these rules all the time or you're gonna get sued that was yeah. one of the things yeah so. and, I, I commend you for doing that by the way that's not an easy job by any stretch yeah, yeah, it, it was. It, we were sold like, a dream. We were sold a dream, and you just said it, Jason. Right? We really were. We were sold a dream of that the government gave us. And your mar marketing, right? It, it, it really was. We get yeah. these fantastic benefits, and we have retirement that is there. And as therapists, to get paid while your doing hours. your licensure hours, holy shit, that's the holy grail, right? Instead of yes. spending nine years working three, four, five, six hours a weekend at a shelter somewhere, trying to get your 3000 hours for your licensure, right? Like we were sold that. And so that was beautiful. It was a 40 hour week. We had all mm -hmm. these benefits. I remember my father-in-law saying to me, you are set for life, Jen. And the, 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 oh, those the, boomers. Right? right? <laughs> yeah, oh my right. God, right? And then, They're oh, so breast cute. Dead. They yeah. are breast dead soul, right? And well, I think that's back, adorable, isn't it? Right? Yeah. And I think back now, and I sit in, in, in my story a year and a half ago when I finally stepped out after 15 years of not only being a therapist, but then also being a supervisor. And I oversaw the captains and the social workers and the psych staff. And I oversaw all of this. I was ready to be the deputy warden. That was my next step. I was being groomed for that. And what I was not told was, it comes back to this dream, was the things you're going to see, you'll never unsee. The vicarious trauma you're going to go through, you're never, ever going to be able to, to shake that truly from your life. Jen, you're going to go somewhere, your doorbell's going to ring, and you're never going to let your children answer the door. You're going to have a code word for when you're out in public so that if you hear something, your kids go the other way, right? All these things that shape your life, you're never going to be able to sit in a restaurant and not be able to see the door. And, and you slowly, your whole life morphs. Your bills are in someone else's name, this whole dream, and you become fearful and everything shifts and changes. And I know you understand that. I know that you have guests on your podcast. I've heard that talk about this. And so for me, I lost myself. I lost my family. I was drinking too much. I wasn't taking care of myself. And it was just all came to that screeching halt and something smacked me enough to go, you need to take a long, hard look at yourself because this model is not sustainable. Um, and that was the dream that was sold to me was though that it was, I, I like yeah. that you touched on the secondary trauma of experiencing mm -hmm. what your clients are going through. And I, that's something that I want to really drive home for other people. Cause again, we've gotten into the deification of this whole process with therapists and PhDs and researchers and, and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. You guys are human. And you take on everybody's pain and different experiences and challenges that people have gone through for a lifetime. And you sit for an hour and you take all of that on and it has to go somewhere. And mm -hmm. so if you don't have a place to put that, then okay. there, there is going to be some maladaptive coping mechanisms that go along with that. And that's like the Absolutely. human, that's the human part. We have to humanize the position yep. and recognize that, man, that it's a really hard job. To be able to do that it takes a very special person to be able to do that day in and day out and amazing that you were able to sit back and again that zoom out and acknowledge yep. that, you know what this right now it's not working and i need to find something that is that yeah it work. can't be and that's a weird part for her and i terry and i have a very similar story which is just crazy because they jive together from the start to the very end of her coming home after getting all these meds, right? And looking at her husband and going, I can't do it. 
And yeah. same thing with me. It was the same exact story. I came home one day and I said, honey, I don't think I can do this anymore. And he goes, it's about freaking time you said yeah. that. And I'm like, we got the same response, different husbands, pretty different, much. We're not, we're not sister yeah. wives. We're not sister wives. We're not yeah. into that stuff. And we do <laughs> right? have two separate husbands. Just so you know, <laughs> just in case you're curious. <laughs> but it's true. And I think so a lot of stuff happened when I worked in the prison and some really not so good things. And I, Jen, you might have to help me out here there. When something happens to a staff member, they do like a critical incident debriefing after, after thing. action reviews. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So they did that after this thing happened on me. And I'll never forget because it was a psychology staff then that would go in and talk to the employees if they needed anything supportive, whatever. And the talking to that I got, because I was in the psychology staff was, you're already a psych associate. So you know what to do. You know what to do. You know what to do. And I, I remember being like, <gasps> okay, I guess. All right, then I suppose, you know, and that was that. And I'm like, I did not know what to do. I did not. I did not. So I just marched on. So I guess that is what I knew how to do. Just march on, just carry yep. on. Gen X, right? Like, mm, just I, go forward. Right? And that's, that is what we do, right? Stuff yeah, it. it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. store it and ignore it. Um, <laughs> store it and ignore yeah. it. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Story I, of my life. I, I use that a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, but I love that you touch on that because sometimes we're just too close to it. So we have all this knowledge, right? And this experience. And we got the PhD and we got all this education. We have we've been doing it for decades at this point. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you're just too close to it to be able to see what the next step is for you. You can do it for other people. And mm -hmm. I, I get therapists that contact me through my social media that are attachment theory is their thing. And they're hitting me with, hey, I'm having these challenges in my relationship. What do you think? <laughs> yes. And it's, you know what? I, I love that so much because it's like they're, they trust you enough. They're letting their guard down enough to acknowledge that it's, you know what? I'm just like, I'm too close to this. And it's really hard for me to get that next path. Mm -hmm. And they're actually really frustrated with themselves because they have that education and they can't deploy it in their own life. And so they're looking right. for that support. And that's often what we need is that extra support, right? To be seen, yeah. heard, loved, and understood and respected, to have that available to us. And that's what you needed in that moment from those other psychologists, right? That yes. are navig trying to help you navigate this. And they failed that day, unfortunately. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like they maybe didn't know what to do either. Like, I, I don't think, yeah, I... I don't know. There was a lot of assumptions going on, but again, Jen and I came out of there with a lot of trauma yeah, and though did. it was such great experience on one hand, and it has really informed both of our practices today on kind of the approach of what not to do. And we're so free in what we can talk about now versus what we were allowed to talk about then. The bi biggest example that I share a lot is I had a client, inmate client, who was very aggressive and everyone was scratching heads and they were throwing meds and whatever. And I did some research and found out that omega-3 fatty acids helped in this jail. So the jail was the closest thing to prison that I had in research. They helped people who couldn't get out of like segregation, they were aggressive, whatever. So they gave them omega-3 fatty acids and it helped the incidence of aggression was reduced dramatically. So here's me. I bring this research article thinking I'm going to save the day, like saving mm -hmm. the day. Here's the right. research, whatever. And that was, costs money. It's not going to happen. I was so <laughs> excited. I was so excited to be like, you know what? Maybe this isn't a med thing. Maybe this isn't, maybe this is a nutrient depletion. This is in the early stages of me even thinking about this. Yeah, stuff. We just need to give them better food guys. Give them better food. Guys yeah. used to order peanut butter to get protein all the time. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. So I was med with you're not a dietitian mm. and basically sit down and be quiet and i was like all right yep. sounds good no that's like your social media response yeah. it does <laughs> right? it really does it really does. sounds it, like the it, comment exactly. section guys. <laughs> no, that does sound like my comment section <laughs> that, that's it talk about just shutting, shutting me for what was to come shutting yeah. things down shut people shut down, down shut things down that don't fit right. that narrative here's what we're doing here's your seat at the table psychologist alongside the psychiatrist and the unit manager and maybe a, a rec therapist and a social worker right here is your silo Get your ass yep. in that silo and stay there. stay there. You're the head doctor. Mm -hmm. Nutrients have nothing to do with that shit. So right. sit down. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause the only role a dietitian would ever have is if someone was like diabetic, right? right? Yeah. They didn't have a role of mental yeah. health and food. No, it was just if you had some physical health, particularly diabetes, that 
or weight loss or something like that. So mm -hmm. just fascinating stuff. And these are really fun conversations to have because they remind me of a lot of things. They remind me of where I was and where I am now and how things have changed so much for me in my practice and what we're allowed to give as far as opportunities for our clients. I think that's the most amazing part. That is. Jen failed to mention one one thing. When she left, who'd she call? Oh. That would be oh, amazing. Yeah. I called her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we hadn't talked in 12 years. Yeah, it had been. Yep. And that's, yeah. Sometimes when you're in your lowest desperate point, you reach out for someone that I consider to be an expert still. And I knew you had gotten out. When yeah. I talk about being in the system, whether you're working for the government, whether you're in the military, whether you're a police officer, you're, I mean, you are in that system, right? And you reach for somebody that you knew got out. And that is what I needed. And more of what I got from her wasn't so much, yeah, come work for my practice. You can be a contractor. It was more about her asking me questions and validating what I was feeling because what I was feeling I knew was going to, it was going to kill me. I, w I wasn't going to be able to do it. And that's really what pushed me to do it was hearing somebody else in that space. you offering me a job felt pretty damn good too, but, yeah. <laughs> but that was it. Like it that, does. That's what, it does. <laughs> and that was an honor too, because she's my unicorn and that will always be a thing. But that was really a good, that was, that's what mattered. So when we go back to what you were talking about right in the beginning about people's experiences and the whole person and what goes into something, that's what it was about. Because on the surface, I had all these things going on and let's blame it on corrections, whatever there is. But there was so much more to it than that. My family was in there. My, my value systems were being compromised, right? There were so many pieces and somebody asked those right questions for me to take a good hard look at it. And that that's really what it's about. That's that whole person strategy versus one little piece is the answer, right? That's what matters. What you were doing when you were going through all of your files and looking at that whole person and all the notes that hadn't been read, right? That's what it's about. We dig a little deeper and the answers are there if people are willing to get inquisitive and lean into it. Yeah. We just want that simple answer though, a lot of the times. <laughs> and it's just, it's never that easy. And if it is that easy, be skeptical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the, the weird thing is we want simple answers, but we know we're complicated people. Like right. we know our bodies are complex. We know all of these things, but yet we look for this simplicity. And I think par probably it's because our lives are so fast paced that we think that we don't ever mm -hmm. have time mm -hmm. to make a change or things like that. That's what I hear all the time. I don't have time. I don't have time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have time. Yeah. yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> And then I always counter with can't or won't because those are I two know. different things. Yeah. And, and it's like, like mm, uh huh, sure. How about you hand over your phone and let's, yes. let's see how much time you've spent on yeah. social media? Ooh, I got to start doing that. I got to, there's got to be an app that tracks. That, oh, mine does. It should. Mine tells me oh. you're up 114% yeah. for last week. I'm like, shit. <laughs> Dang this podcast yeah. started. <laughs> this is what I'm on all the time now. Like no joke, because I'm the only, I don't have help. I do all of this myself. My phone yep. told me that I was on the phone for 24 hours. Oh <laughs> wow, you I lost died. a whole day of your life. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I did, man. and I'm just like, so I'm constantly. I I take videos from the computer, then I drop them on my phone, and then I put them in CapCut, and then I color grade them in oh, CapCut. Sure. I add the yeah, captions. Mm -hmm. And so you go through this whole process. Plus, I'm always listening to uh, audibles or podcasts and, and mm -hmm. all this other yeah. stuff. It's just funny. When I saw that, though, I'm like, yeah, I might have a problem. That's, yeah, that's a I, I might have that's to like lot. dial that down a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's hard because it is like even TikTok, like you when you go on a roll and you see yeah. it and like people are liking mm -hmm. it, you get sucked in. It's like gambling. You get sucked right into that feedback right. system and you're like, yes, I got to do it again. And you're like, yeah, I mean, anytime I push it too hard, it, it flops. So mm -hmm. apparently I just need to light the DSM on fire more frequently. And it's done. That's it. 20,000 followers. <laughs> oh, exactly. I'm start lighting shit on fire. Yeah, I'm, I'm so frustrated with social media. I had a good run on TikTok for a minute and then like they stopped pushing my content for whatever reason. And then it just like, hits your motivation. Now I'm not exactly motivated mm -hmm. to, to post on that platform. I'll give it a video every now and then. And then, <laughs> and then a, mo a month later, it's got 20,000 views and I'm just like, cool. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. I hate social media. I, I always tell her all the time. So I had no digital imprint up until about she a year ago. She had nothing. None. I, I literally had, I had nothing. Yeah, because, but now she's got everything because of I me. Know, so and, I'm and a I bad do. I didn't even know. I didn't even know how to get on fairy book. I don't even talk about me being like the, the millennial cusp at that. And you know what? I, I am not, I am back. Like I'm an old soul. Okay. <laughs> I should have been born in the like early seventies, mid seventies. That's where I fit. And I, I didn't even know what I was doing. And I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even put anything on Facebook. I, I didn't know what it was. And oh so fast. Yeah. A year ago, right. so imagine yourself like 12 months ago, never having a digital imprint. Like the closest I got was I started a Snapchat account so I could spy on my daughter. And that's it. <laughs> that was it. And so I had no clue what I was doing. And so I really dislike it a lot. If I could do all of this and market and do it without having to touch social media, that would be the trail I would take. Because mm-hmm. I just I just can't stand it. it. It drives me nuts, and it's so much time, and it's right. so saturated, and some of it is such BS. And I'm like, oh my god, how do people even post this stuff and watch this? Oh, you have a dinosaur arm, therefore you yeah. have ADHD. What is this? How am I even competing in this no, pool right now? No, like, no, hold hold up, stop right there. That's not a thing. <sighs> no, yes. <laughs> apparently, standing apparently. like a flamingo apparently is so the thing. Too, when like, I go to sleep oh. like this. Correct. Right. You're you, I, you've yes. That, you're neurodivergent. ADHD? You are part of the neurodivergent community when you sleep like that. Just so you know. Just so you know. This is the I'm pool we're competing in. Is, I can't. Yes. I can't mm-hmm. even. I just sit there and I get so mad. And I'm like, okay, I'm not even. Nope, we're not posting anything today. This is BS. <laughs> last year, it was last year around this time. You had just started. Jenna just started working with me, and it was at a horrible time on TikTok for me. I was being dragged dragged <laughs> yes i had hit a come across a community that was not nice no. and i didn't even know that i didn't even know it wasn't an intentional thing and those are the worst kinds because you're mm-hmm. like this isn't intentional whatever mm-hmm. but they dragged me as if it was intentional i was a trending hashtag on tiktok and i'm like for all the wrong reasons by the way like it wasn't a good reason but now i'm like okay so i was a trending hashtag cool like i'm gonna use that now and to my favor but at that time i was so hyper vigilant like Mm -hmm. i was so scared like i would be up at night looking until I realized that you could filter out a bunch of stuff. And I'm like, okay, Mm -hmm. filters on now I can actually Mm -hmm. sleep. But I had so much anxiety over that, like so much that I wasn't sleeping. And my husband's like, come on, you need to not worry about this so much. And I'm like, but I worry about my reputation and I don't intentionally try to hurt anybody. And so when you're no stranger to being in the public eye, like you've been on several media outlets for years and years. I just Mm -hmm. want people to recognize that. Like you're not just... TikTok yeah. famous, like you. Yeah, I'm just. You've had a whole career in this where you've been brought on yes. as an expert in, yes. in many different capacities. So yeah, television, radio, yeah. all of the stuff, and right. but TikTok brought me to my knees last year, and it probably yeah. took me three months to crawl mm. back out of that weird abyss and start again. And then it happened. To, it didn't happen again because I think I found my audience. But then I started posting these things about informed consent when. And then it started happening again. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Like people were like liking and commenting and all this stuff. And I was like, it's going to happen again. I can just feel it. It's going to happen again. I don't want it. It didn't, thankfully. Well, it is going to happen again because you guys have a podcast called The oh, Gas- God. Gaslit <laughs> it Truth. Is, it is. I tell yeah. her that. I'm like, yeah, it's coming. Get ready. And, yeah. and your big three is big food, big pharma, and big marketing. Yes. It is. Yes. It is. So, so it is going to, you're right. It is going to happen again. Oh, it's, it's going to happen hardcore. <laughs> Man, gonna I'm going like to find you. You're going to have to come take care of her because <laughs> I'm, I'm sometimes I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm trying to just turn it off. <laughs> shut it down. Get off of it. And stop. Yeah. Right? Well, it's oh, funny yeah. though, is other content creators reach out to me because they have the same experience. Like they're in that earlier space where they're struggling a little bit and they get hit with all these just weird statements, right? The statements don't yeah. make sense. Why would somebody say this about me? I don't understand. And we take it right. so personal and it's, what do I do with this? I'm just trying yeah. to help people. Yeah. And right. it's okay. That's your mission, right? You're trying to help people. Cool. You can't help that person and that's okay. So you can block them. If you really mm-hmm. want to go that far, you can just leave it and yep. just let your audience handle it and they will eventually. Well, right? 
Yeah, I call it. They'll take out the trash. No, yep. your audience you, will take out the trash. Yep, your mm-hmm. tribe comes and, and cleans yep. it out. They do, and they do a pretty darn good job of that they too. Do. They do, but it's true. We are definitely opening ourselves up to some controversy here. Yeah, but I feel like I'm in a good space to do it. Maybe that was just like prompting me to get get my shit together before this happened. This is gonna happen, but yeah, I have a feeling this is gonna ruffle some feathers. And but that is that's the whole point, isn't it? When you just think one way. And social media is a great way of just their algorithm just give you the same stuff over and over again. You get lost in your own echo chamber. You are not thinking critically at all. You are not an empowered person. Right. It becomes your truth. It becomes your truth. And I tell people this too. I'm like, because everybody has their little fan base, right? Anything you do, they're going to be liking, commenting, sharing, all this stuff. And although that's really sweet, I'm still like, but you can question me. It is okay right. yes. to question me. Challenge I me want you to. I don't want you just to, to be like Dr. Tara Lynn said it. So it's the truth. It might not be your truth. It could just be my truth that I just said. I don't know. But I want you to be curious. I want dialogue. I want conversation. Right. I think that's the only way we're going to get out of this, especially when it comes to mental health. Like we have got to create alternative dialogue about the person, not just the medication. Right. Right. Like Mm -hmm. we've got to present these things. And I feel we're going to be giving some big voices to people to share their stories and sharing our stories at the same time and and being open for some Mm -hmm. bitch slapping (laughs) along the way. I don't know. know? I I think there's going to be a lot of challenging dialogue along the way. And I've been fortunate enough so far where I just keep asking people to be on the podcast and they say yes, which is. I'm just some dude from central Illinois guys. Like I I have, I don't know these people. I've never shaken their hand. I've never been in front of them. I just, I go on Instagram, I send a message and they either say yes or no. And so I've been fortunate with that. But of the people that I've been able to interview, they all have this same perspective where they're trying to make a shift in the field of psychology, Mm -hmm. right? To get people to think a little bit differently, to look at a more holistic perspective in some of these circumstances and experiences to, I saw one guy on TikTok the other day and he made the statement. It's yeah, it's not popular, but the majority of people, you don't have a mental health issue, right? You have to get out and start doing things for you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And when you start doing those things, everything else starts to line up a little bit. Yeah. Now that's not the cure all and that's not yeah. for everybody, but for the strong majority of people, maybe you that's should think about put the coffee down, go outside, mm-hmm. go for a 20 minute walk, do it every day and then see how you mm-hmm. feel at the end of a week. If that's any better for you. We, again, we look for simple solutions. That is not complicated. We mm-hmm. can walk. Most people can walk pretty well every day. Stupid simple. Minutes. Yeah, it it is stupid simple. Do you drink water? That's one of the first questions I ask people, and I am blown away by it. No, No, they don't. (laughs) They don't. don't. Wait, hold on. The big one is when you ask people like how much coffee they drink. How many monsters do you have in a day? Or how much alcohol they drink. And they'll say, I'll say, How much coffee do you drink in a day? And they're like, Oh, two cups. And I'm I'm like, oh, okay, two cups. Like, why would somebody not say the whole it? Yeah, that's the cup right there. Like it's a huge Stanley 32 ounce. That's one cup. And it's no get real with yourself. And that is stupid simple. It is stupid. And it seems really ridiculous for therapists to be like, Are you drinking water? Are you do you drink I'm sorry, do you eat protein at all throughout the day? It ever? And they look at you like Mm-hmm. I'm here to talk about my problems. And I'm like, yeah, yep. Yes. That could be one of your problems, by the way. <laughs> like, exactly. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. It's, it's never just is, one thing. It's always a right. series of things. It right. is. So that's going back to those four pillars, eat, sleep, move, meditate, yeah. pick a pillar and start in that pillar and make some changes for yourself in that mm-hmm. pillar yep. and then move to another pillar. You don't have to do all the things all the time, but you have to start in one pillar and move from there. And that does involve some self-evaluation. And now that doesn't mean that your shitty relationship isn't paying paying you're not paying a price for your shitty relationship or your crappy job or whatever it is those things also but those are bigger issues right those are things that are often not so much in your control whereas how much caffeine you drink that is 100 in your control how much you walk that's in your control what you think about things going back to this is shouldn't be as mind-blowing as it is for me going back to the mitochondria your mitochondria is impacted by your thought process 
Right. Yep. Like what the frick? Like your mitochondria is either going to produce energy or shut down and preserve based on your thoughts because your thoughts are stressful, frightening, or calm and relaxing. Mm -hmm. So it's like your thoughts actually have a lot to do with it. People don't like to hear that. For some reason, they want the answer to be something else. It's not my thoughts. That can't possibly. I'm like, but it is. Your perception <laughs> of reality is the truth for you, but it's not the truth. truth so you're telling you know? me I'm not my thoughts. I am actually telling Whoa. you, you are your thoughts. So that means you can change them and be someone else. Yes. Slip of that. Yep. <laughs> That's the whole thing, though, is we're constantly presenting ourselves with information that is true for us. And we don't sit back long right? enough in yes. silence to actually address it and say, is this true? And so Actually, you, you live your entire life with a series of core beliefs about yourself, about the world you live in and the environment that you're in. And that is my life. That is my map. That mm -hmm. is how I see the world. And we yes. never sit in silence long enough. Put your phone down, get your earbuds out of your ears, sit for 20 minutes in silence and see what pops up for you. Mm -hmm. Meditation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we take everything at face value and that just becomes part of it versus getting curious. Over yeah, it. but then you're an angry 85 year old. <laughs> Right. <laughs> because true. you lived your whole life never questioning why you feel the way that you do and why you think the things that you do. It my my heart breaks for all of the staff that I worked with in corrections who were so incredibly bitter and mm -hmm. hated life every single day. And now I can sit on the other side of this and it's there's such simple pieces that that, that you could do and and they they just were so stuck in it. Mm -hmm. This is how I see the world. This is how I see life and I can't view it any other way. And it just takes people down. It takes well, them down and they can't get back up. Even in that same scenario because it's such a core close knit group. Like yeah. there's so much group think that happens in that scenario. You have one person mm -hmm. that comes in and they're not having a great day or they have a series of a bad six months yep. and everybody else is going to feel that they're mm -hmm. going to feed they off do. that. And that just becomes everybody att negatively attunes to one another sure. in that experience. Yep. And then you become yep. miserable, but then there's the epigenetics of the job, right? Where it gets passed down to all these other people and the new recruits and the people that you're training, mm -hmm. they, they, yep. they yep. adapt they that same thought they process. Do. And, they do. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you, you in, step in some in. respects, I think not just the inmates had mental illness, but so much of the staff did too, whether it was addiction or mental health problems or even PTSD from just being on the job for so long. And it was unattended to period. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe some of that had to do with the superiority complex. There's no way I'm the mentally ill one. You are Mr. Inmate, like not me. Mm -hmm. That's, so I mm -hmm. think People were, would justify it like that. I, I just did a whole podcast on that with somebody who was a deputy sheriff for, mm -hmm. for yep. years and years. And we were talking about mental health and entering the job as a first responder and not recognizing that you had experienced some sort of trauma to begin with. Yep. And then it shows up at some point on the job because now you're taking on all this other stuff and all these things are happening. And I don't think we talk enough about that, like mm -hmm. that when you enter into that field and, and this can be applied to any field, but acknowledging oh, therapist that, field. I so many. Oh, therapists well, why do therapists because, become therapists? But it's really funny because if we have another. <laughs> two days. I did not become a therapist because I had trauma or mental health. And people assume that I'm like, no, I had mental health because I became a therapist. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, it happened yeah. as a result of that. And that's now, a very Gen X thing to say, though. That's, that's better <laughs> than my story. That is you know, a very Gen X thing. Yeah. I was a latchkey kid. I took care of myself since I was nine years old. There's I don't have story. trauma. There's my story. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Oh, See, sure I told you I am too. the wrong age. Yeah. But I, I have not. But I did it. Like, and I'll have to. I was an overachiever. Chair. I was. Yes, yeah. I was. We'll probably have to share that on our podcast, like how we got into it, because I think people are automatically assume that it's a. You yep. were mentally ill once, yep. which is why you became a therapist. And a lot of people in the addiction field particularly had addiction yeah. issues. And so they became clean and I'll became yep. an addiction counselor, whatever it is. I look at that experience. And I'm like, I think I'm on the other side because of the stuff I've been through. Now I bring a different framework to the clients that I deal with and to myself, to be honest, like you can look at things so much differently. So even though all of that was 
not good. Some of it was really amazing. And now, particularly in retrospect, now that Jen and I are talking about it openly, because I haven't really talked about it a lot. This is not something that I go and talk about much. It's been really empowering to be able to talk about it and have a new lens about it and how it has impacted my work today, because it is very profound how it has impacted things today. I'm just grateful for these opportunities to like use my mouth hole a little bit more. (laughs) That needs to go on the merch. So That's they, going on the merch. Is that so you can deep throat the truth? So we can deep throat the truth. We, yes. We can deep throat it. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's got to so, be on the merch. Oh. Yeah. So we can't leave that there. You, okay. Your yeah. podcast is The Gaslit Truth. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the podcast, the mission and vision, where it's going, and what people can expect from you guys moving forward. Yeah. Well, that's the start of the deep throat piece. I think we have to address that just because (laughs) of the double entendre. People automatically, yeah. yeah. So many people didn't like it. They're like, my husband didn't like it. Her neighbor didn't like it. Uh, Clearly, clearly. Yeah, they didn't. And and I think to be fair, he's a boomer. (laughs) And so, and so, so some people don't understand it either. Like they're like deep throat. And I'm going, do you not remember Watergate? Do, do you remember learning? And so most people too, depending upon where they're at, some people are like, I don't even know what the hell that, what are you talking about? Watergate? I'm like, okay. So then I got to do a whole history lesson, right. <laughs> oh. but it started by her and I, Terry and I were bantering back and forth about, we had got, we had the title together and we were talking about what we want people to get out of this. And I, I think I, usually it's me talking out of my ass, which is something I do a lot. Like I have this whole other language that, that means things that people are like, what are you even saying? Like when I say yep. put her in the parsley, how do you not know what don't put her in the parsley means? Don't put your car in the ditch. It's obvious. I know. I never yeah. knew. I told you the color commentator. Yeah. Exactly. All right. right. I know. And so here I am just spouting off shit and out of my mouth comes, we want people to deep throat it. And there was a pause and it was like her and I went ding, ding. Oh my goodness. And then I said that not even pulling the Watergate reference into it. And then she spouts out and she's, oh my goodness, we are the deep throating informants, just like in the Watergate scandal. And I went, holy shit. And it just, it, the, the birth of the child happened right yeah, there. I love it. Like, I remember the birth of this child. This is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> my other two, yeah. fuzzy, this one yeah. I got. So yeah, It's got so much marketing potential. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. Yes. And it, it's so abrasive. Some people just don't like it. And I'm like, yeah. that's fine because you don't have to yeah. like it to learn yeah. something. So it's, mm-hmm. that's the whole thing is, and it, to be honest and to be fair, I think, and Jen, you can speak for yourself on this, but there was a little fear about talking about prison stuff and where we came from. Are we burning bridges? Are we doing these things? And I'm like, you know what? But at the end of the day, we're not disparaging anyone. We are saying our truth in the matter. This is what we learned. We're not going around saying certain people are this or that. This is our truth. And this is how we see it right for us. And I think that's what makes the podcast pretty powerful too, is that we are not just saying, Hey, here we are, do what we say, like us, Mm -hmm. all the stuff. It's there's more to it. Think critically, think around it, ask questions, be curious and learn about people. Yeah. You know, that fits mm -hmm. into our little pillars too. When we were trying to come up with what matters, right. And it's, we want people to be inquisitive. That was the first one, right. Cause you got to find your truth. Yours is not going to be what ours is, but we're going to give you a hundred different avenues. You maybe didn't think of. Right. And so we want you to think, we want you to be irritable. People are going to get irritable. Let's ignite just a little bit of that in them, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's some of these things are going to be very difficult to go through and you're going to feel a little funny. Good. Feel funny. Feel there's going to be resistance. Yes. So we want you to be inquisitive and get curious and be irritable. Those two are really important. You might not like it. It's going to be from all the people you used to work with. Um, (laughs) Probably. I Probably. think they're secretly that's... fangirling. I don't know. I, I don't think there's some those secret girl fans out there. Yeah, yes, I think they're, so. they're still in it, and they yeah. knew it. We all knew it when we were in it, but it was right. hard to look at it. Yeah, but it's just really hard to admit, right? So it's you want to tell your story of resilience and the experiences that you've had. Yep. That dog. That dog I tell you what. Oh. <laughs> signifying the end <laughs> yes. like i'm done now like you, you can be done soon here you've been yeah. talking to these women for quite some time now dad let's go no but i did want to say so we are launching february 
20th, right? Is that February yes. 20th? Yes, yes. February 20th. 20th. That is, is a uh, Tuesday. That's our big day, our big mm-hmm. launch day. So we're real excited. So right now we're on Instagram and YouTube at the Gaslit Truth Podcast. So please go there, support us. And yeah, send us a DM if you want to be on the show. <laughs> Right. Oh, that's awesome. That's right. We are so, open. So you're looking We're... for people to be on the show. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Sure. Professionals, non-professionals, consumers, like all of it. Like it, we don't want it just to be our voices the whole time. We want people on the show to create some more of discourse. So more conversation. I, I do know what's funny is the people that follow me, they keep asking for solo episodes. And oh. I much prefer doing this type of podcast because it's more fun for me we get to talk about a lot of different things and then they get to learn some stuff and it's that's interesting that you want to hear from me why would you want to do that but we've got some work to do on your core belief but anyway <laughs> okay it's fine stop well, therapizing him not no, that. I'm sorry it's hard yeah, it's, so, Can't it's, just turn it off. <laughs> it's so true because it's like sharing again sharing my story this is my story right mm-hmm. and i want to give it to you mm-hmm. but everybody's still alive in the in my past exactly and how do you share these things as yours this is my story my experience has nothing to do with you right right this is right. my perception mm-hmm. and so i just i haven't figured that out quite yet on on how to tell that stuff and then keep most people the happy piece. but the piece yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah. a tough it's definitely yeah. a tough road but and it's not bad road. things right it, but it is my perspective and people are automatically there's going to be that resistance they're not going to like it it's not going to feel good and so don't listen sorry my mother would immediately call me and be like that's not what happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> that's so common man <laughs> i know <laughs> I'm going to invalidate your truth 100%. Exactly. Yeah, that absolutely did not happen. That's no. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, no. Mom, how would you know you were working? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Doesn't oh. matter. Oh, Don't. that's so funny. What yeah. do you think? What you feel? Nope. You're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> you are wrong. <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Man. And it is. <laughs> Nice. Dr. Tara Lynn and therapist Jen, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the show today and making us laugh and just having a really great time and letting us know that not only do you have a podcast called The Gaslit Truth, but you're also looking for people to be on the show who are going to share their knowledge, their experience, and some of their challenges and how they overcame them and maybe drum up some stuff in regards to big food, big pharma, and big marketing. We'll, we'll see if we suddenly disappear off the planet. Yeah, you're, we'll start, you'll start challenging some core beliefs here. You're you're gonna know that is so true. You're gonna be the one savior who's gonna have yeah. to come find us it's when our digital you. imprint is gone, our bodies are gone, everything's yeah. gone. I'm relying on you. You're in we'll, charge. We'll have to come up with a code word that we can text <laughs> okay. to each other. Yeah. Will do. <laughs> Thank you for having us, Jason. This has been for awesome. Sure. Yeah, we'll have to do it again sometime. I really appreciate it.